So first, I would like to thank Christian for inviting me. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, he and the other organizers have put together an extremely eclectic program. So I can say we are now about, as Monty Python used to say, now for something completely different. Um, I'd like to say in terms of the prior talks that I've enjoyed them a lot, and I thought that Christiana's talk was the most enlightened talk about ethics committees that I've ever heard, and I would request you to come to Canada to supervise our <laughs> ethics committees there. So, for the next 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about randomized trials stopped early for benefit, which can be called truncated randomized trials, and I'll use that short form TRCTs, and I'm going to explain why they tend to overestimate treatment effects. I'm going to talk about some of the consequences of relying on those overestimates, and then I'm going to talk about going from individual trials to systematic reviews and meta-analyses and the implications of truncated trials for systematic review and meta-analysis and the implications for their results. I'm going to start by telling you the story of a randomized trial which looked at five versus four courses of therapy for acute myeloid leukemia. The chemotherapy given for patients with acute myeloid leukemia is not an easy thing to do, not very friendly, not very pleasant, and the only reason you would do that is if you could improve mortality. In this particular trial, when they took the first look at the data in 1997, there were seven out of 102 patients who had received five courses of chemotherapy who had died, and 15 out of 100 who had received four courses. That represents a 57% reduction in the odds of dying and a p-value of 5 in 100. And you can see there the visual depiction of the point estimate and confidence interval. Now, speaking since we've just heard of ethical perspectives, who would think that at this point there would be an ethical mandate to stop the trial and ensure patients with acute myeloid leukemia were able to get their fifth course of chemotherapy? Who would stop that? Nobody would stop that. All right. 1998, uh, they took another look and they had 23 out of 171 patients had died in five, 42 of 169. We now have a 53% odds reduction. Our p-value is three in a thousand. Who would think there is that this is time to stop the trial now? Okay. Who thinks they should have continued at this point? Okay. Almost everybody who has put up their hand says they should have stopped then. They didn't. And here's what happened as the data <coughs> accumulated. Had they stopped when virtually everybody in this room said they should, there would have been the dissemination of five courses of chemo toxic chemotherapy to the harm of patients with no benefit. As you see, in the end, the trend was slightly toward harm in death rates. So you would have the toxicity and no benefit. Why did this happen? Well, let me try and explain. Let's assume you have a treatment with a small, true beneficial effect. And let's say one we're going to do, as I think often one should, multiple trials of this particular treatment. Some of those trials would start out from the beginning with a treatment effect close to the truth. However, there would be a minority of the trials that would start out underestimating the treatment effect, perhaps even on the harm side. But as the data accumulates and more and more patients are enrolled, the random error decreases and you would move toward the truth. And some of the trials 
would start out with large overestimates of the effect due to random error, but gradually move toward the truth. Now let us say I were to look at the data after every patient, and I would say, if I see a particularly large treatment effect, I have an ethical responsibility to get this effective treatment out to patients and not to deny the effective treatment to new patients. However, if you did look after every patient or event, any trial that ever crossed this boundary, as a number of them will, you would stop, declare victory, and have large overestimates of the treatment effect and make a mockery of conventional p-values. Well, statisticians have recognized this phenomenon for 30 years or so, and so that they don't suggest that we stop, look after every patient, but that we look periodically. And so we look after 250, 500, 750, or 1,000 patients, for example. This ameliorate, ameliorates the problem. It's not as bad, but still it doesn't eliminate it. If these looks happen to ha happen at a time of random overestimation of effects, you will have the trial stop and you will uh, declare a treatment effect that could be very substantially greater than the truth. And this is what would have happened in that leukemia trial that I just told you about had they stopped early. So this is the phenomenon. And when when statisticians have done simulation modeling of this situation, they find that on average, trials stopped early for benefit will overestimate treatment effects. So, I will now tell you a story of what can happen as a result of this phenomenon, and I believe the damage that can be done. In 1999, a trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And by the way, these trials stopped early and show dramatic effects. They tend to be published in high-profile, prestigious journals, as was this one. This was a randomized trial in patients undergoing elective vascular surgery. They compared a beta blocker of risoprolol to placebo. The primary endpoint was a composite of death or myocardial infarction. So you got counted as having an endpoint if you died. You got counted as having an endpoint if you had a non-fatal myocardial infarction. They planned a single look at the data after 100 patients using a well-established statistical stopping rule. They said they stop if their p-value was less than 1 in 1,000. And what happened was, they had 59 patients, two of whom uh, had the primary endpoint, 3.4% in the active treatment group after 102 patients, 18 of 53 or 34% in placebo, a extremely impressive 91% relative risk reduction, and if you believe the upper boundary of the confidence interval, the relative risk reduction is at least 63%, and they squeeze under their stopping boundary p-value of 1 in 1,000. This trial had a profound effect on the medical and cardiologic community. Um, uh, well, by the way, before I get to what happened in the medical and cardiologic community, a meta-analysis done after the Colderman's trial, which showed a bigger effect than other small trials, would have still showed a 60% relative risk reduction, although if you consider the other trials, the upper boundary would be a 15%. But the Colderman's trial was highly publicized. It was the one that influenced people the most, and the extremely prestigious and influential guidelines from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association said that patients like those in the trial should certainly, strongest recommendation, be given beta blockers. And other patients who were not quite like the ones in the trial but were at higher risk of having cardiovascular events after their non-cardiac surgery should also receive beta blockers. This was widely disseminated and was sufficiently powerful that in the United States at least, 
for many hospitals, it became a quality control criteria when you were judging the quality of care delivered in the hospitals that patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery received data blockers. Well, we, a group at our university, did not believe this. They thought, we thought it was an overestimate. We thought it was not established. And we did a randomized trial of over 8,000 patients in contrast to the 112 that were in the Polderman's trial. Uh, we confirmed that there was, we, and if you put all the data together, uh, uh, including a uh, systematic review done by Christian's group, if you put all the data together, you, have, you do have a reduction in myocardial infarction, but much, much smaller than in that trial. 31% relative risk reduction, confidence interval from 53 to 14%. But death is going in the wrong direction from uh, Christian's meta-analysis, a 23% increase in the relative risk of dying, although the confidence interval includes a very small decrease. So a suggestion of increased death, but not definitive. But what was definitive was an increase in strokes, and most of these were major strokes, disabling strokes, a point estimate of more than a doubling in the risk of stroke, with an in confidence interval of a 37 to a more than threefold increase in stroke. The clinical expert community has struggled with these results, and you still have some, some uh, elements of the community recommending beta blockers. Why is this? In my uh, uh, completely <coughs> conflicted opinion, I was an investigator in the big trial, uh, it is because if for 10 years you've been telling people to use beta blockers, it is hard to go back. Uh, there are other similar stories. One is with low glucose targets in the intensive care unit. An initial trial suggested that low glucose trial targets would lower mortality. Again, it became a quality a criteria. The subsequent trials have shown that low glucose targets do not lower mortality and cause increases in serious hypoglycemia. It's been a struggle for the clinical community to change. Other prominent overestimates, adjuvant chemotherapy for bladder cancer, low tidal volume ve ventilation, activated protein C in critically ill patients. So, the story so far is that individual trials stopped early for benefit can often overestimate treatment effects. Those overestimates will be particularly serious in all likelihood if you have trials like Polderman's it only included 112 patients in 20 events. So small numbers of events, small trials, stop early, big overestimates. And they are dangerous because they are published typically in top journals because they have such exciting results. The clinical community, if they aren't aware of the dangers, buy in. You start getting guidelines on the basis of this, and it's very difficult to go back once you've gone there. But, what about systematic reviews? Can systematic reviews that pull together all the trials deal with this problem? Well, we know that individual stopper trials uh, overestimate. However, when you do simulations, if you were doing a whole series of trials with the same strict stopping rules, you find out that leaving out the truncated trials underestimates effect. Not only that, but the overestimate from, if you put all the trials together, including the truncated trials, is minimal.